Max, thanks for being on the show, man. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So welcome to The Greatest Stories Never Told. Today we have a special live episode with my main man, Max Lugavere. Max is a New York Times bestselling author. He's been on the Dr. Oz show more times than anyone except for Dr. Oz himself. Max, I heard a rumor that in 2020 you're going to try to be on it more than Dr. Oz. <laughs> That's the rumor, yeah. That yeah. isn't a rumor. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Rachel Ray show, you're on there all the time. You're on The Doctors. You become one of the biggest uh, advocates for good health in America and going worldwide with Genius Foods, your original book. How many languages is that translated into? Eight now. It's pretty insane. Uh, amazing. And how many copies sold, can we say? Uh, probably couple couple hundred thousand. Amazing, you know. amazing. And this book, your next book, Genius Life, is dropping March soon, 17th. right? March, March 17th. March 17th. That's yeah. real soon. Can they pre-order now? Pre-order right now. Well, and let's tell them what you've been studying over this last amazing decade of yours so they can get a little tidbit of the knowledge you're going to drop. But, you know, really, this is all about today's show and the fake health foods that have permeated our American diet, foods that we've been lied to about from the big food companies. They've been telling us they're good for us. They've been even saying they're going to like help our hearts and help us avoid cancer and lose weight and this and that. The truth, though, is a lot of these are doing the opposite. Am I right? Yeah, totally. There's a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to what is good for us. Um, and also what is bad for us, you know? I mean, every day I feel like consumers are being uh, fed, no pun intended, uh, mistruths about, um, I mean, you name it, anything from salt to the healthiness of animal-based products, uh, which you know, I think are, are, can be very healthy, um, mm. to uh, mistruths about whole grains and grain products and fat-free products and cholesterol-free products and mm -hmm. uh, fat in general. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of um, misinformation. I think in many ways it's fueled by corporate interest. Um, and beyond just that, just, uh, you know, agenda-driven biases coming, coming to us from like the highest levels of, uh, you know, well-credentialed medical experts that- Yeah, well-funded. Well-funded. Um, and so- my passion really uh, in terms of my, 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 my place in this, I think, is to really help consumers um, separate fact from fiction. Uh, and I got into this, I learned from you, you always want to start with a story. And uh, my story is that I got into this because my mom got sick at a young age and she had a form of dementia that she suffered with for seven to eight years. It was uh, really heartbreaking to see somebody who was really in the prime of her life uh, begin to decline in the way that, um, you know, I mean, you usually kind of expect much older people to, you know, like, like senior citizens to, yeah. to uh, decline. But I was seeing this in my mom, somebody who was in her mid fifties, still had all the pigment in her hair. Mm. It was heartbreaking. And, um, she suffered with that for seven years. And then, uh, Labor Day, 2018, I was actually here in this house when I got the call from my brother, it was just after we had gotten back from Burning Man, actually the first time I'd ever been with oh, you. Oh, man. And I was here. We had just arrived back in L.A., and my brother gave me a call and said that my mom was in the emergency room. Um, and I was set to go back to New York like a few days later. But uh, it turned out she had become jaundiced, which is what happens when uh, bilirubin, which is a pigment, it's the pigment that gives stool its color, um, to back up into the blood and it seeps into the skin and the whites of the eyes and a person basically becomes yellow. And usually why that happens would be, uh, the typical scenario would be a, a gallstone, blocking okay. the bile duct, causing that to happen. But um, I didn't wait for a diagnosis. I changed my flight. I immediately zoomed back to New York, went to the emergency room, and they had just given my mom an MRI of her abdomen. And uh, she had a tumor on the head of her pancreas. And so... Mm. From one day to the next, she was put on on hospice, and it was the worst three months of my of my life. Pretty much watching mm -hmm. her decline, and those three months were uh, right in the middle of the writing process of this book, actually. So it mm. was a, a hard book to write, timing wise, but yeah. um, but it caused me to look at the world in a, in a new way. And so this book is more of a lifestyle guide in okay. genius foods, and it looks at all the little things that you can do in your day to day life that are not only going to make you feel better. And feel happier and have more energy 
and uh, shift your body to a, to a more optimal body composition. Mm -hmm. But it's going to help guard you against the ravages of aging and help to reduce your risk for conditions like heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and other forms of dementia. What's the most important thing in this book? I think the, the primary message is just how empowered we are when it comes to our choices. But ultimately that um, the odds are stacked against the average person. Um, whether it's a food supply that's become saturated with ultra processed foods um, or the fact that uh, we've overruled many aspects of nature that our biology has come to rely on uh, over the millennia that we've evolved. Like meat? Uh, like meat. Well, meat's, I think, an important part of, of proper nutrition, you know, depending on what kind. Um, a lot of people would argue with you on that one. Yeah, happy to, happy to discuss that. I mean, I think that you know, we've co-evolved with our food, right? And meat, certainly, access to animal sourced products um, were integral to our evolution. In fact, researchers think that it was actually access to meat, and not just meat, but cooked meat, that catalyzed the growth of our brains. Mm. Um, why, why meat over the vegetables that the forager ancestors were eating? Well, if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, an animal eating an animal is absorbing nutrients in their most bioavailable, bioidentical form. Many animals eat other animals. Yeah, many animals eat other animals. And in fact, carnivorous animals were the first animals. Mm. Um, you actually have to develop specific adaptations to, to be able to assimilate the nutrients in plant foods and make them bioavailable to you as an animal. It's just like comparing one operating system to another. And that's not to say that plants are not good for us. They are. I'm a big advocate of consuming lots of plants. But when it comes to the nutrients that we know are crucial for good health, um, and specifically the ones that are unique to animal foods like vitamin B12 and uh, a, a range of conditionally essential nutrients like creatine, um, things like that. Uh, protein, I mean, protein is, is highly bioavailable in animal products. Um, there's just no better place to get them. Would you say that vegan is a fake healthy diet? Uh, I would say... I would say that it's not an optimal diet from the standpoint of health. I would, yeah, I would, I would probably, I would say that it's a, um, it's not a healthy diet. I mean, you can make it healthy, okay, but it's not uh, healthy on its own. Just oh, by that, virtue, okay. of, just by virtue of the fact that it excludes animal products, that okay. does not make it a healthy diet. That's a great point because you go to a lot of vegan restaurants and you're getting the fried this and that, or the pastas and the pizzas, with the cashew cheese that. Someone like our friend Dr. Gundry would argue is very bad for you with the lectins that are in the cashews. But at the same time, a lot of media right now, Game Changers movie, What the Health, preaching vegan as the optimal diet for high performance. Not just a healthier than meat, but the optimal diet. Yeah, it, that's BS. Um, I think that you can optimize the, a vegan diet, and you can be a high-performing athlete on a vegan diet. There's no okay. doubt about that. You but can. blanket vegan blanket does vegan not mean healthy. Yeah. yeah. In so fact, would you say the highest optimized vegan diet for someone who wants personal performance, athletics, brilliant in the mind, is on par with the optimal omnivore diet? Uh, no. I think that being an omnivore is going to be superior. Um, but people people choose to go vegan for different reasons. And, yes. And I have utmost respect for people who make that choice and they do it for, you know, what they see as being an ethical, uh, you know, reason. The meat and dairy industry is pretty jacked up. It's pretty jacked up. But, yeah. but you know, I think that uh, you can really spend an endless amount of time researching these topics. And, um, like, the food system is infinitely complex. It really is. It really is. And so... We think that we have an understanding of how the food system works. And I barely, I mean, you know, I've barely scratched the surface in terms of my own research on it. And, you know, you take your average person who thinks that they know, you know, how the food system operates according to what the media headlines will portray. And it's just the reality couldn't be further from that. So, um, so yeah, I think that there's, it's very complicated and it's not as black and white as, uh, you know, if you go vegan that you're minimizing animal suffering. Because actually, if you consider the fact that, you know, one cow, one life essentially could feed you for months 
and then you compare the total area under the curve of suffering, the total net suffering of killing a cow to eat, you know, meat, super nutritious meat for X number of months versus the amount of animals that are beheaded or displaced uh, in, the, in the growing of big commodity crops, uh, you know, plant-based crops. Because they're clearing land? Yeah. Is that why? Yeah, because they're clearing, clearing land. So I don't think that it's a one-to-one comparison at all. I think that, um, you know, today, just by virtue of how complicated um, and, and just like, just how big the food system is and, and you know, how really it was created to feed this, like, this growing population, there's blood on everybody's hands. So is, the best thing that you could do is to eat in a way that's going to optimize your health. Okay. Is it true that many of these vegan crops are grown in manure, animal manure? Well, I guess there's no such thing as a vegan crop. But yeah, I mean, well, vegetables. Is yeah. that still a, a thing? Like um, manure is a is a. I, I mean, in a re, in a regenerative agriculture system, in yeah. organic, yeah. regenerative agriculture, not necessarily organic, but in like yeah, where you have animal husbandry on the land, yeah. Okay. Um, they use, I mean, in the conventional farming system, they use a lot of like synthetic fertilizers and things like that. Yeah. I don't actually know what they're putting on the like on the soil. They yeah, know what they what they spray the crops with. But. Yeah, I'm not vegan, but I get happy when I hear someone else is because I just know the meat industry has so many bad players. At the same time, there's people like Belcampo Farms that are creating sustainable farming that treats the animals ethically and also gives them the nutrients that make them the healthiest for human consumption. I know you're a big fan of. Yeah, I mean, I think some systems do it really well and some systems don't. I mean, I don't, I have, I don't uh, endorse the factory farming system at all, but companies like Belcampo, you know, they're, they're a great example. They're carbon negative. They're like, I mean, they, they, you know, they take care of their animals. They get them to eat grass. It helps create healthier soil. Um, it actually helps the soil sequester um, carbon. Yeah. Which is super important. And the meat is amazingly healthy. Yeah. Amazingly good for you. I mean, anybody yeah. who's going to point a finger at their at what they're producing and say that that's somehow unhealthy, um, they're just, you know, they would be incorrect in that statement. Yeah. You know, I firmly believe that. Yeah. So let's drop in to the seven health, so-called health foods that are indisputably bad for you that vegans and carnivores will agree once they know the science that we're about to talk about today, we should probably be putting in our bodies either not at all or as little as possible. Yeah, sounds good. So one that you talk about a lot is vegetable oil. Yeah. Uh, vegetable oil, you know, corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil. Um, these kinds of oils have really only been in the food, the human food supply for the past 100 years. Um, and that's because prior to 100 years ago, we didn't have the chemistry labs required to create these oils. Mm -hmm. um, and they all undergo really intensive industrial processing. It's, and they, they basically all endure a step in the production process. One of the reasons why they're so toxic is that they all undergo a, pro, uh, a process called uh, deodorization, which is sort of like the food industry's equivalent of the witness protection program, where they take these, um, these oils that are uh, really actually bitter. I mean, if you can imagine like what soybean oil or corn oil um, or even canola oil, which is very bitter, um, actually might taste like, well, it's hard to imagine also because you can't squeeze a corn right. and have oil come out. Right. Exactly. So, they so use it's very chemically processed. Intensive. Yeah. It's very fine to turn it into oil. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. And these oils have like, you know, they have flavors that would be unpalatable uh, if you were trying to use them, for example, in salad dressings or granola bars or to fry food in or to saute food in in restaurants. So this deodorization process, which I said is sort of like the witness protection program, it's like it, it basically takes all those, those unsavory oils and it makes them as bland as can be, scentless, tasteless. Um, and that, that process actually creates compounds called trans fats. And we know that artificially created trans fats, there is no safe level of trans fat uh, consumption. It causes inflammation in your blood vessels. Um, it damages your cardiovascular tissue. It damages your brain. Um, it increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, for Alzheimer's disease. So, yeah, I recommend uh, avoiding them. But they're still marketed as being very healthy. I see ads in, in magazines all the time 
claiming that these oils are good for you because they're cholesterol free and they'll help mm -hmm. reduce your cholesterol and things like that. Yeah, I recently researched the history of canola oil and it was super interesting. So as you probably know, canola oil was originally called rapeseed oil because it was made from the rapeseed plants, which is kind of like those mustard plants you see growing in California all over when you hike in the hills. And that they were putting this rapeseed oil out and then when they finally came up with a technology to test it, they found that it was increasing, is it pronounced urethric acid? You know what I'm? I think urethric. Eurekic acid, yeah. yeah, in the human body, which is highly toxic. And so at this point, rapeseed oil was everywhere and they had to do a mass pull from all of the shelves and stop putting it into food products. And of course, the big food companies freaked out because they were making so much money off this cheaper oil when in the past they'd have to use olive oil or something that cost a lot more money. So they called up a couple of Canadian scientists who genetically modified the rapeseed and made it so it no longer produced that urethic acid reaction. And the genetically modified rapeseed plant is what they use to make canola oil. And the name canola actually comes from the words Canada and oil low because acid. it was created- Can Canada low acid. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, Canada low acid. So it's it's GMO oil, which, you know, the GMO thing is a whole nother argument. I've heard interesting points that say there could be genetic modifications that make food better for you, it could make it worse. But make no mistake, canola oil is genetically modified. Unless you go to Europe, they still call it rapeseed oil, but I think it's a state, oh, you know what though, it is the same genetically modified oil. They just actually call it by its old name rapeseed oil yeah which still has that acid in it um it's still okay it still has it over there yeah got I mean, it oh okay and you know what i realized that the when i was doing my research the genetically modified canola oil is banned in europe mm. they only allow the natural rapeseed oil they don't allow the gmo oil wow throughout europe the whole european union cannot mm. use this that is in just about every restaurant in the united states at, like every restaurant yeah it's uh I'm not. I'm not super concerned with like GMO just on, okay. its, on its own. Okay. You know, on its own footing. I think that. I mean, the first of all, there's only about twelve products. Or ten, I think it's like actually 10, 10 products that are regularly gonna be GMO. So if you're buying like nuts, for example, like mixed nuts, and it says no GMO nuts, that's really just like fear-based marketing because mm. uh, you'll never find like GMO almonds in the, in the supermarket. Okay. Or it's like when they say hormone-free chicken, but hormones are not allowed to be put in chicken. Correct. Okay, yeah. got it. So all chicken is hormone-free in yeah. the United States. Yeah, well, yeah. added hormones. I mean, chickens have hormones, you know, but. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, but canola oil in general, like no matter where it comes from, GMO or, or not, I mean, I, I think it's worth avoiding because they contain these trans fats. They contain a very uh, high concentration of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very damage prone. Um, omega, they do contain omega, omega-3s, but Actually, that's not something, that's not a benefit of the oil, actually. I think that's, um, that actually uh, further detracts from its, from its um, nutritional value because omega-3s are more damage prone than omega-6s. Um, so yeah, you definitely, you know, I would say want to avoid canola oil. There's a bunch of animal studies that are coming out saying that it damages the brain. Mm. Um, and just, it's, it's overall not good for your, for your health. So use olive oil coconut oil. Yeah. I, I know you don't have a, a issue with consuming palm oil, although it does do bad things often in the deforestation. Yeah, with, I mean, palm oil is not, um, it's primarily a saturated fat. Okay. Uh, so it can be used to cook and things okay. like that. Coconut oil too, it's a, it's predominantly a saturated fat. It can be used to, to cook. Um, you can use it as a flavoring and things like that. The primary oil that I suggest that people use is extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Close second would be avocado oil. Okay. Uh, it has a higher smoke point, but it's still very chemically stable. Okay. Um, you can cook with both, but avocado oil you can use probably for a little bit higher heat. What's the next fake health food people need to watch out for? Uh, agave is one of these that I hear about all the time. People are, make the switch from like refined sugar to agave, and they think that that's a wise move. Agave is primarily fructose. It's like 99% or 95, something like that, percent fructose. Which uh, so is the sugar that's found in fruit, but no fiber, is that right? It's, it's found in fruit, 
Um, but it's thought that excessive consumption of, of fructose in particular, because it's processed differently in the body than glucose, that it's uh, one of these factors is that the root cause of you know, the skyrocketing rates of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that we're seeing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely worth avoiding, avoiding fructose. What happens is when we consume glucose, it's, it's sort of handled differently by the body. If you're, if you're active and you're exercising and whatever and you consume a little bit of glucose, it, gl- it goes to your muscle tissue, which can be a storage site for glucose. Um, fructose only goes to the liver. And the liver only has a sugar storage capacity of about 100 grams. Um, and for most people, uh, the liver is just always replete with, with stored sugar. Mm. Stored sugar in the liver is called glycogen. Okay. And so when you consume excess fructose on top of that scenario, it causes your liver to create fat. And so that can, you know, cause fat to be stored in your liver. It can, it can then, um, uh, you know, dump that, liver, that fat into the blood and cause an elevation of triglycerides. Oh, man. Which is fat in the blood. So good argument for cutting out sugar as much as possible in general. Yeah, you should cut out added sugar. I mean, the dose makes the poison and everybody's different. But yeah, okay. I think you should cut out um, added sugar. It's a you know caloric, uh, it's just empty calories. And what about monk fruit, uh, which is also known as stevia that a lot of people are talking about? Uh, I'm a fan of monk fruit and stevia. Like in moderation or can yeah, you I just say, like pour that, I mean, I would pour say, some sugar on it, Def yeah. Leppard style? Pour some. Um, I, could, I think that you can use it uh, however you like to use you know, sugar. If it's like to sweeten your coffee, you can bake with it and things like that. Um, so and yeah. it's... it's Perfectly healthy, or um, I think in moderation, it's probably healthy. Okay, there's uh, you always kind of want to reserve a little bit of caution, and I think one of the one of the potential um, downsides of consuming these things with abandon is that it just keeps you kind of craving sweet foods. That's true. Yeah. So you know, I think it's it's better to moderate uh, your consumption of sweet things. You know, whether it's from a non-caloric sweetener mm-hmm. or sugar itself. Okay, so we got vegetable oils, we got agave. What's the next fake health food people should watch out for? I would say uh, whole wheat. Um, gluten? Well, gluten, you know. I, I, gluten is a form of wheat. Yes, sir. A, it's a protein found in wheat. Protein bar- found in wheat. Barley and rye, yeah. Okay. Um, but I think uh, the fake health food would be, you know, nobody's marketing gluten as like a health food. Uh, right, but gluten free. A lot of people are talking about gluten free. Is it gluten free? Well, that was going to be something? another fake health. That's so another one. Okay, free. okay. So yeah, yeah. let's let's focus though on the whole wheat. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So most the whole wheat that you're going to see in the supermarket and commercial breads, it's so refined and so processed that it really doesn't matter matter whether or not it says whole wheat. I mean, it's going to be a so it's better for you. It would be like a whole wheat bread loaf for yeah. whole wheat egg McMuffin. Yeah. It's trying to sound healthy by saying whole wheat. Yeah. Like it's a whole grain, yeah, but it's actually processed to death. Yes. Yeah, if mm. you were grinding the wheat yourself and you had a more coarse sort of grind to the wheat, then that would that would be a lot better for you. But reg, I mean, whole wheat as we sort of uh, know it in the supermarket, used to make those breads and cereals and things mm. like that. Um, the problem with eating ultra processed foods like whole wheat bread is that you absorb a hundred percent of those calories as sugar, whereas Whole foods and like even whole wheat that you would grind yourself, you absorb a lot less because your body just doesn't have the chance to break it down fully. Mm. Um, so yeah, avoid avoid the whole wheat breads. Would you go so far as to say fuck whole wheat? <laughs> fuck whole wheat. All right, all right. That's I knew, right. I just knew you wanted me to say that. I just you know <laughs> I wanted to know if you would go that far, but not if you're grinding it yourself, which no one's gonna. Which do. Which nobody's gonna do. Yeah, okay. I think I think most breads are processed foods. The vast majority of breads. Bread is like one of humanity's most revered processed foods. I mean, they talk yeah. about bread in the freaking Bible. But you right? don't eat bread. I don't eat bread, no. So I let's mean, move into the gluten-free then. Yeah. Because that's where you see bre- uh, uh, a lot of bread that you think it might be okay to eat. Yeah. Because now it's gluten-free. So is this number four, gluten-free products? Let's yeah. go to number four. Yeah, so yeah. gluten-free, fake health foods. So just to be clear, if you're, if you're celiac, it's amazing that we have all kinds of gluten-free products now that you okay. can feed your family. Um, and feel safe about. So I'm not uh, crapping on the proliferation of gluten-free products. I think that that's actually a very good thing. Okay. Um, but I think a lot of people will, will reach for these products thinking that they're better for us. 
And they might be a little bit better for you because I don't think that gluten is, is a health, is, you know, I think it's worth avoiding. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but generally, they're really not better for you. I mean, a gluten-free cookie is still, glu- is still a cookie. You know? Still probably has sugar in it. Or- yeah. Tons of, it could still have tons of sugar and things okay. like that. Um, so, yeah, avoiding these, like, you know, fake health foods that uh, beckon you to, like, to buy them because they say that they're gluten-free. Um, but just because a food is gluten-free doesn't mean that it's healthy. Dairy-free. You're not dairy-free. Uh, or you are. Wait, I, I, you I, are dairy-free, but you're not vegan. I'm not vegan, no. I consume, but you are dairy-free. I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm dairy-free. I, I mean, I consume dairy in moderation. Di- in moderation. Yeah. Cheese, whole milk. Uh, not really cheese. I'll do butter or ghee. To cook butter with. or ghee. Um, milk? No, I don't drink milk. Is that because of the casein? Yeah, there's a lot of lactose in it. Okay. Um, I think if you're going to do dairy, the fer- like fermented forms of dairy make the most sense. Okay. Um, uh, full fat, from the you know, in terms of like what the data says about low fat versus full fat dairy consumption, um, full fat seems to actually have a protective effect mm. against metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, heart disease, and things like that. Mm. So, I always try to go for full fat dairy options. Um, I think that there is a place for fat-free dairy. Like, you know, I think fat-free, like Greek yogurt, for example, is a fantastic protein source. Okay. Um, and is that something that people can buy at the store and not have to worry about a bunch of crap in it? Or does it usually have a bunch of sugar and stuff? Well, you want to avoid the fruit on the bottom yogurts. Like the yogurts. That's without, just pure sugar, right? sugar, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's why the research suggests that people who eat low-fat dairy tend to have worse health. Because the low-fat dairy products tend to have all that added junk to make it taste better. Ah, so I don't actually, it's unclear whether or not the health benefits seen from people who consume full fat dairy yeah. are from the fat itself in the dairy. Yeah. Or if it's because they're just avoiding these low fat dairy products that have all kinds of other bullshit added into it. Are we going to go so far as to say that the fifth fake health food is low fat dairy? Let's say that. Yeah, let's say that. Low fat, uh, low fat milk. Yeah. Uh, non-fat milk. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Yeah, most of the time these products have like lots of added junk. Lots of added junk. Because you're moving, you're Can you check the label on that? Like, let's say yeah. you are a milk drinker. Can you check the label? Just want to make sure that there's no added sugar. No added sugar? No added sugar. Okay, yeah. same with a, a yogurt or if you're getting for your kids like a yeah. chocolate milk. Maybe they have a stevia flavored or something like that. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, chocolate milk is going to be loaded with sugar. I don't chocolate, know. There's any, no healthy yeah, chocolate milk. Yeah, there's no milk. healthy chocolate milk or strawberry, okay. strawberry milk or anything like that. Okay. Um, let's talk about... A fake bad for you food potentially, dark chocolate. What are your thoughts on it? <laughs> that is a fake bad for you food because dark chocolate is actually very good for you. I'm a huge fan of dark chocolate. Made correctly though, right? Because a lot correctly. of times it's made with cane sugar and things like that. Yeah. But I've seen you posting about the stevia sweetened dark chocolate. Yeah. What should someone look for in a dark chocolate bar if they want to eat a healthy dark chocolate bar? Question one. Question two. If they find with your specifications, is it actually really healthy or is it just healthier for you than, say, a, a milk chocolate bar. Yeah. Um, you want to look out for chocolate that has an 85% cacao uh, concentration or higher. 85? 85. Okay, I've yeah. heard so 70, but you're saying dark. 85. Yeah, okay. go dark. I mean, okay. even 70, to me, feels too palatable. You know, I'm, it's very hard for me to moderate my consumption of the bar. Mm. I want to eat the whole bar. Okay. And it's going to have, I think, a little bit too much sugar. I mean, a, just a 70% chocolate bar is probably going to have about 20 grams of sugar in the, in the entire bar. So that's a good test is if you want to keep eating it like a fiend. Yeah. It's probably highly sugared. Yeah. The term for that that sci- food scientists use is hyperpalatable. So a hyperpalatable food ah, generally drives its own overconsumption. Like Cheetos are designed to be the most palatable food, right? So you have exactly. the, the crunch and the yeah. cheese, but it's just completely unnatural and yeah. terrible for you. Yeah. Okay. The vast majority of hyperpalatable foods, I mean, they, they have one thing in common, and that is that they combine sugar and fat. Sometimes salt. But generally, mm. it's sugar and fat. Okay. And sugar could be wheat um, as well. You know, okay. wheat and fat is just a, a really palatable combination. Okay. So chocolate, eighty-five percent cacao, sweetened with stevia. How do you feel about xylitol? I'm okay with xylitol. Xylitol or stevia? Xylitol, not stevia. cane sugar, not agave. Uh, yeah. I mean, if it's the again, the dose makes the poison. If you're looking at an eighty-five percent bar, okay, and it has cane sugar in it, yep. you're probably not getting very much cane sugar. What's a 80- gram amount? Because I actually do eat a lot of dark chocolate. Yeah. And I typically look for six to seven grams of sugar per serving. 
And the only reason I look for that max is not because of any scientific calculation. It's because that's usually the lowest amount of sugar I can find in a chocolate bar. That sounds like the bars that you're looking at are like in the 70s, you know, 70, 75% cacao. Okay. The 85% bars that, I, that I've seen, they, they're more in the like four to five. Four to five grams, grams per, per serving. serving. Per serving. Range. Okay, so that's a yeah. good range where you can look at and, and enjoy the snack yeah. and not have to feel guilty about it. But even better if it's stevia or xylitol sweetened. Or erythritol. Erythritol is another good one. Monk okay. fruit's another good one. Monk fruit and stevia, the same thing? Uh, monk fruit, they're not the same thing. No. They're not the same thing. Oh, I monk thought it was. Monk fruit and stevia, no. Monk fruit is, has another name. It's called Lu, Lo Guan Ho or something like that. It's, mm. uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's actually a Chinese term. I don't, I forget it, like exactly what it is. Okay. Um, but, uh, but so you'll see two names for that. Um, and then there's stevia. Okay. And then erythritol, xylitol, allulose is another pretty tasty. The one, uh, one fake healthy sugar substitute that you'll see a lot of in these processed foods, well, there are a few. Under the category of these fake fibers, you'll see inulin or chicory root fiber. You really want to avoid those. They're sweet and they're not technically sugars, so manufacturers love them because they'll, I mean, they'll, they're sugar-free. And so they put them in these processed foods like chocolate bars and protein bars and things like that. They say it's a prebiotic. Yeah, but actually, I mean, if you consume too much of, of those, they, ca they can cause, like, intense bloating. I mean, you're, if you eat too much chicory root fiber, you're going to have to work from home that day. Are there not, though, prebiotic supplements that have those things in them? They do, but you really want to be careful. And, the, you know, a lot of those fibers, actually, it's unclear whether or not they truly act the way that we would expect a fiber to act in the body. So mm. fiber is fiber. We call fibers um, fibers when they're not actually uh, absorbed by us in the small intestine and they pass through us either as insoluble fiber okay. where it's literally like uh, matter that doesn't, that doesn't uh, get digested by us nor does it get fermented by the bacteria that live in our, in our stomachs. So like corn cellulose would be an example of a sort of, uh, of, an, of an insoluble fiber. It basically passes through us and you know it might be good for us because it acts like a sort of exfoliant to the digestive tract. But then there's other, there are other kinds of fibers that are uh, soluble fiber. And those kinds of fibers actually get fermented by the bacteria that live in our guts. Um, what's unclear about these kind of fake fibers, like chicory root fiber, is whether or not they actually don't uh, get digested by us. Because some people have found, people who are now using like continuous glucose monitors and things like that, that they'll eat these products that are sweetened primarily with these fake fibers, not expecting to see any bump in their blood sugar, and yet their blood sugar goes through the roof. So I'm very skeptical of any of these products that use these like fake sugar-free fibers um, as sweeteners. Let's talk about diet sodas. Yeah. Um, diet sodas can be uh, good for people making the switch from regular sodas. Better than regular, okay. Um, but I don't think that they're better than water. Um, what do you think about the artificial sweeteners that are in them? I, I know aspartame, you and I have talked about on a podcast yeah. on your show before, mm -hmm. about how that was pushed through the FDA, even though it was giving uh, lab animals tumors. Mm. Yeah, I avoid aspartame. Um, I avoid saccharin. I avoid sucralose. Um, a lot of that is just personal decision. I think that if you're consuming a little bit of those things here and there, it's probably not a big deal. I make, I've made the personal choice to, to not consume them because now what you're seeing are a lot of uh, sodas and products with, um, you know, made, made with like stevia and things like that, which I think are probably a safer bet. So you can find those out there. If you want to drink a soda, you can find a stevia sweetened soda. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Because I consider Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi to be some of the original fake health foods. Yeah. Marketed as a weight loss plan, but those artificial sweeteners were just coming around and those lab tests is so terrible, yeah. yet they got pushed through the FDA for approval. I mean, if having a diet soda is going to be like a, uh, you know, a, an indulgence for you that's going to help you adhere to your diet, then by all means, have your, have your diet soda. Okay. I'm um, going to disagree with you on that one. You're going to disagree? I'm going to disagree. Okay. I'm going I'm to agree to disagree with you. All right. Yeah. I think if you're trying to be serious about your health, try a Perrier with a lime, something to mix it up. Iced tea, unsweetened iced tea. I think there's so many alternatives. I think there's no reason to mess with the diet soda. Yeah. There's so much research. Did you hear about the University of Texas study where they followed, I think it was almost 1,000 people for nine years, and they found out the people who were drinking diet soda were, on average, higher 
uh, rate of obesity in the yeah. double digits yes. than the people who hadn't? Yeah. I, I don't think that they're good for you. I mean, okay. I don't endorse them, and okay. I think that you're better off without them. Um, but, you know, I just don't want to, like, fear monger on, on, you know, where fear, uh, you know, fear mongering is not warranted. But I, I, I agree with you. I just think that it's, uh, you know, for people who just are, like, you know, trying to make those, like, baby steps. Um, that if Be- better wanna, than regular soda. I'll give yeah. you that. I'll give yeah. you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I, but I choose to avoid them. And I, yeah. Um, I do think that even like a stevia flavored diet soda is going to be better for you than, you know, an aspartame sweetened diet soda. Diet Can soda. we agree that the fake health food number six is conventional diet soda? Yes. Great. What's number seven? Oh, man, number seven. Um, I have a list, actually. Let's see. There's so many. Uh, oh, I mean, this is an easy one. Fruit juice. Fruit juice. Yeah. Like a glass of home squeezed orange OJ? juice. Yeah. No bueno. You know, orange juice was invented by an advertising agency. It was? It was, yes. Interesting. Yes. So back in the early 1900s, the leading ad agency in America was called Lord and Thomas. And the head of Lord and Thomas was a man named Albert D. Lasker, who was an innovator in the advertising world and did a lot of wonderful things in the space and created some of the most iconic brands of our time with his advertising, like Whirlpool, like wow. Van Camp Beans, like Schlitz Beer, like Pepsodent Toothpaste, which, uh, in fact, Max, when Pepsodent Toothpaste came out, only 5% of Americans were brushing their teeth on a daily basis. Within 10 years, that ad campaign got 85% of people to be brushing their teeth. That's amazing. Wow. So next time you French kiss a girl, <laughs> you can thank, thank Albert D. Lasker. And the advertising era. But another client of his was the California Growers Association. The California Growers Association specialized in oranges. It's a huge crop of California. And they are so good at growing oranges in California that back then they had a surplus of oranges. So many that people wouldn't go through them, you know, because how often do you eat an orange? So they got together and they said, well, what else can people do with these oranges? And the growers talked about how, well, sometimes for the kids, they'd make a special treat and take the orange and they'd squeeze it into a cup and they could drink the juice to see how sweet the orange was. And so they rolled out an ad campaign talking about uh, squeeze the juice, squeeze the juice and went nationwide. Orange juice became a phenomenon and it became also considered as a part of a healthy breakfast, which I think was a part of their campaign as well. You know, that you're going to oh, drink the fruit. That's what it was. It wasn't squeeze the juice. It was drink the fruit. Wow. That's what the ad campaign was. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's unfortunate because fruit juice is basically just sugar water. I mean, what, if it comes from fruit or not. Um, mm. Even yeah. the high pulp stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's just not a significant amount of pulp. To, it's also pre-digested. Pre-digested. I mean, what I was saying earlier about the fact that when when you process food, the body, biologically, it it it... It affects you differently. Um, I mean, there might be a, uh, when you consume and you're juicing with your teeth, like an actual whole piece of fruit, the absorption through your small intestine is a lot smaller. I mean, is a lot lot slower. Um, This is the same with foods that, you know, if you take whole nuts, for example, and you're chewing whole nuts, particles are left uh, unchewed, essentially. And it's, it's a lot more difficult for you to digest. And in fact, a significant portion of the calories found in whole nuts that you would think you're absorbing actually pass through you completely undigested. No kidding. Yeah. They did a study recently. Um, the, U- the USDA funded it. Um, and it was funny because the makers of Kind Bars, which mm-hmm. is a fake health food, mm. um, they leapt at the opportunity to use the data that uh, was released by the USDA to lower the calorie counts on their on their on their granola bars. So what the USDA found? Wow. The, they, what they did was they gave subjects whole nuts, and they had them eat the whole nuts, right? And uh, they looked at how many calories were in the ser- how, you know the servings of nuts that they ate. So you know they gave your a person, we'll just say a hundred calories of almonds, right? Then they looked at the calories that remained in the subject's stool. Kind of a gross experiment, but needed to be done. Needed to be done. Very interesting. Okay. What they found was that um, there were about 30% of the calories remaining in the stool from the nuts. 
So there was like, say, 30 calories of stool. And they can figure that out by like burning. burning. So these nuts were just, you're making your body work for not a yeah. lot of not a so nutrient take. So almonds have 30% fewer calories than we had previously thought. Wow. Yeah. And so Kind Bar used that data to lower the calorie count on their bars. Yeah. Making Bar- it bars even that nuts. faker health food. Yeah. I picked up one of those at the hotel I was at a few weeks ago. Man, and it was loaded with a lot of, a lot of weird stuff. A lot of weird stuff. But here's the catch. That nut butters, so like almond butter, okay. is going to have just as many calories as was previously considered to be the case. Because, because it's, it's pre-digested, pre-digested, it's just so much easier for your body to assimilate. So you're a fan of almond butter? I'm a fan of almonds. Almonds? Yeah. Not almond butter or yes almond butter? Well, I like almond butter. Wait, you just said that almonds though, even though you're a fan of whole almonds too? 30% of the calories in, in whole almonds are like a free pass. Essentially. Oh, that's okay. I thought you were saying, I thought your point was that almonds aren't as good for you as people originally thought. No, they are good. They're good. They're yeah. better. They have fewer calories. Okay. Calorie okay. Excess okay. I, I misunderstood that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Got it. So, and almond butter, because it's basically pre chewed by the machinery, it's processed, right? Yeah. All those calories go into, so that's one of the reasons why ultra processed foods really are at the bedrock of the obesity crisis. Because it just takes no effort for our bodies to digest and assimilate. And we're ingesting and assimilating 100% of those calories. Um, but if you stick to a diet based primarily on whole foods, whole nuts, whole produce, whole animal products, I mean, you're probably passing a significant amount of those calories. It's one of the reasons why I think that calorie counting um, is such a, a poor way to approach your health because it could be subject to such a wide margin of error. We don't know how many calories we're actually absorbing when we eat primarily whole foods. Mm. But ultra-processed foods, you're absorbing 100%. 100%. So going back to orange juice, the thing is, when you eat a whole, you know, when you eat a whole orange, you know, who knows how many of those calories we're actually absorbing? Probably a fair amount. I'm not, you know, I mean, uh, an orange is probably pretty easy to to digest, but that fiber is probably keeping, um, you know, some calories uh, intact. Um, pushing it through the digestive tract, but the juice, you can be sure, that's mainline sugar. Wow. Yeah. Talk, what about green juice? That green juice is good for you, right? Well, if we're talking about vegetable juice, I think that's fine because um, vegetables are low sugar. Okay, but if it's a blend, you know, a lot of times when you get a green juice, it'll have your pears or your apples in there to sweeten it up. Definitely avoid those because mm. you want to, I mean, you want to avoid fruit juice. Sometimes I'll drink like a kale, cucumber, celery juice, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, which has no fruit. Actually, cucumbers are technically a fruit. So, you know, cucumber juice is a fruit juice. But generally, when we're talking about, like, sweet fruits, mm-hmm. you want to avoid the juices from those, from those fruits. Would you go far as to say, fuck fruit juice? Fuck fruit juice. <laughs> Fake health food number seven, fruit juice. Yeah. Max, this has been great, man. Thanks for diving in on this. Thanks for having Very me. Very educational. I learned a lot. I hope everyone did at home. Hope everyone on the live stream really enjoyed this. Your new book, Genius Life, they can go on Amazon and buy it now? Yeah, you can pre-order it, geniuslifebook.com. Okay. Pre-orders are, we are giving out lots of cool free bonuses. You're going to hook up our audience here, Greatest Stories Never Told audience, with something special? Yeah. What? The opportunity to pre-order the book. How about a live meetup in Los Angeles with you? Let's do it. I'm down. They can come to the next live show. Yeah, that sounds good. They got to order the book, though. Yeah. Great, let's do it. Yeah, I mean, the book, you know, I worked really hard on it, so you want, you know, you want to put it in people's hands. But here's the thing. For the first 1,000 pre-orders, I'm sending out signed uh, book plates, so you're going to be able to get your book signed uh, via an official book plate from the publisher. Sweet. I also have three uh, other goodies that I'm giving out um, for free Um, for people who pre-order. We've got a guide to um, reading science and how to understand it. It's basically a guide to becoming a citizen journalist. I've got another... um, a free PDF ebook that is uh, the Genius Life Guide to Restaurants and Supermarkets. So simple things that you can do when you're shopping or eating out that are going to make your uh, make your experiences healthier. Smart. And a guide to ten supplements that you you can use to potentially boost your brain function. Got it. All but this is pre-order. this is about much more than food. This is about much more designing your entire life around sleep, brain health. Body health, muscular strength, mobility. Yeah. It's all in there. I can't wait to to read it. I haven't even gotten to dive in yet. I just got my reader copy. So thanks, man. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks Thanks for for coming on the show, man. So much fun as always. Always a pleasure. We'll have you back soon. We'll do it live with you guys. So write us, let us know you want to come and be in the live studio on it. So 
Max, thanks. Everyone give it up for Max. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to hear a story that's even wilder than that one, click here. You only have five seconds, though. Five, four, three, two, one, go!